are winding down. Um, we have uh, this class, and we have two classes next week. Um, what my plan is, is to, I want to talk about two applications probably fairly quickly, probably not quite in as much detail as we have some of the other applications. Um, and I, I would also like to give you sort of a work day for you to come in and work on your projects, any outstanding assignments for the entire period with assistance. And I would strongly urge you to do that because if you're running into difficulty, you know, we can get through some issues and work through them that way. So my expectation would be, and again, this is subject to change, of course, that, that today and next Monday, we look at these two applications, and then uh, Wednesday is, is a work day. Um, you know, you can ask questions about the final. I would expect to have information about the final uh, prior to that point. Um, the two applications that I want to talk about, again, First of all, I have to confess, I, I haven't prepared as well as I normally do for this one. So um, this could make for some interesting results and, you know, uh, be sure to, 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 you know, share the YouTube video with your friends because it might be good for a laugh or two. Um, but the reason I picked these two applications is because these are moving into the area of making more truly a mobile application. Um, there's a great book, um, and I can't remember the name of it, um, but it's a thin book, and it, it talks about designing mobile applications, not from the viewpoint of like designing the user interface or from a coding perspective, but from what really makes something a mobile app. And some of the things that make a, a, a mobile app, as opposed to just an application that, that runs on a mobile device, something that's truly a good mobile app, is something that takes advantage of the distinct characteristics of a mobile device. The fact that it has a GPS, so it can tell you exactly where you are. All right? That's a good mobile app. Um, the fact that it's typically connected to a camera, or it can play music, and all the things that a mobile device can really do, and all the things that a mobile device is really used for. Um, the other component is um, the, the social aspect of it, you know, in terms of like sharing stuff with people, whether it be through email or text message or whatever. So the last couple examples um, I think are, are, are good starting points into looking like at not just apps that run on a mobile device, but a, a truly mobile type app, if that makes sense. I mean, for example, the rock, paper, scissors, you know, you could have done that program in C Sharp or Visual Basic or whatever and created a desktop app that did that, or you could create a web page that did that. There's nothing specifically mobile about that app, whereas some of these other things, and I haven't taught the class before, but that's what my plans are for the advanced Android class, is to look more into the um, stuff that's distinctly mobile and distinctly Android related, as opposed to just programming in that platform, but really taking advantage of the capabilities of the device. So let's look. This one app, I, I hope it will run correctly. I was having trouble when I was trying this in my office probably because my office couldn't get a GPS signal. Let me try to look at it. a route tracker application. And I don't know if this is doing any different than it did in my office. It might not be able to get the GPS signal. Let me play around with this for a second and we'll see. Let me click. There's a button down there that says start tracking. I think we're supposed to be seeing a Google map here, if I remember correctly. I click start tracking. And I walk around. I'm going to actually walk out in the hall, try to get 
and sure enough, it doesn't tell me. It, it's supposed to give me an alert that shows me how far I walked and all that. I'll take a look at, at what's, what's going on with this to see, you know, what the issue might be, why it's not, uh, why it's not um, working the way that I would expect. The other application creates a little slideshow. And this gets into the media aspects of mobile device. The fact that typically a mobile device, you think of being rich with multimedia, and mobile applications are often rich with multimedia. So I click on this enhanced slideshow, and what I can do is, unfortunately, enhanced slideshow is stopped. All right, here we go. I can click the menu and create a new slideshow. I can give it a name. I'll call it test. And then I can go in and I can create almost like a little mini PowerPoint presentation. Not really as feature rich as PowerPoint, but the idea. For example, I can add a picture. So I can go and put a picture in. I can add another picture if I want. And then also add music to it. I'll play one of the and then I can play. I should be able to take a picture too. Let's do that.
students, I think, try to, try to hit the home run and try to do everything all at once, where I think you really have to think in a modular way. I mean, that's how you ought to be developing anyhow, right? Is thinking creating objects and creating classes and functions and all that. And if you have that mindset, that it will sort of lead you down the right path. It's just so much easier to test, it's so much easier to debug, that I would strongly urge that. All right, let's look at this slideshow application then. And first thing I want to look at is finally, after a couple false alarms, we have something interesting in the manifest. We have a lot of the same things as before. One thing that we do have, I don't recall if we've seen this before, is we're forcing the orientation of it to be portrait. All right. Typically applications, if you have uh, no preference, you, you let the application orient itself to the way the screen is oriented. But in some cases, there's a good reason for you not to do that. And the developers of this application must have felt that it was worthwhile to force this to be in portrait mode. So it doesn't matter which way I turn this. It's staying in portrait mode. It's unlike other applications that will go and will um, move themselves into position. This uses a theme. And that theme is in let's see. Android style. must be something that is built into the uh, Android platform. It's used a couple different times to do a couple different things. For example, on some of these activities, the theme is set to have no title bar. So, again, I was just double checking to see if that's something we define, and it doesn't look like it's something we define. It looks like it's something that is part of the framework. Notice that the picture taker, again, forces the orientation to be landscape. Whereas it looks like the slideshow doesn't do anything, in which case it can be oriented however they, uh, they need it to be. If you look, again, it looks like we have, and actually I may have to eat crow here. It does look like we have four activities. I was thinking that there was, was a couple extra. Some of those might must all be contained within uh, the same activity. So I stand corrected. Lastly, we have some permissions on the bottom. All right. That states what are some of the things that you can do. And this is a big uh, characteristic in the Android platform is that um, you inform the users of what it is that the application wants to be able to do. All right. That way there's no surprises. Uh, if any of you use Android when you install apps, typically you get a screen's worth of this will check your phone state to see if you're talking on a phone call or not. This will, um, you know, this will write to your SD uh, card. This will do this. This will access the internet and so on. And the whole idea of this is that there's no surprises. All right? so. You know, if something does some updates and you're suspicious of it, it's like, why would this application need to update? You could possibly then, you know, not install it, but at least it warned you. Now, let's remove one of these permissions. 
Let's remove the permission of being able to use the camera and write external. Let's remove the permissions. Now let's go and try to compile and run this and see what we get. enough, it did seem to go in and work. Let's try and do some things and see if we get an error. I gotta save this picture off of here. It's the worst self-portrait anyone has ever taken. <laughs> enough it's given me an error when I go to write it because I didn't have right permission. Uh, I, I, or I, I removed the request for right permission. So what does that imply? That implies that if someone's trying to pull a fast one on you, all right, and someone doesn't put in the permissions that they're going to write to your memory, and they try to, it won't work. All right? So that's a nice security feature that's built in. The application has to tell you what it wants to do for certain behaviors. And if it doesn't tell you that it's going to do that, it won't let you do it. Interesting thing is, if I'm not mistaken, the camera lets me use anyhow. Oh, actually, no, it didn't. It stopped it. Yep. Yeah, it stopped. So good. So in other words, by removing those permissions um, from, uh, from the manifest, the application won't let you, or rather the Android operating system won't let you uh, do the things that require those permissions. So that's a good thing, as Martha Stewart would say. That gives sort of the extra security to the people that are using your application, that if it's going to do something a little bit out of the ordinary, that you had to agree to it. So normally when you install this, and again, not when I'm running in debug mode, but if I were to like take and put this on the Android store and install it, a message would pop up saying that this is what it wants to do. Is everyone familiar with that message? Have you seen that before? Let's go and install something real quick. If I can, eh, never mind. Actually, I'll, I'll do it on this one.
So we're going to try to down, uh, install SoundCloud on this, which is an audio application. So I click install. I get a list of the things that it might want to do. And then again, this is a consequence of being in the Android manifest. If these things weren't in the Android manifest and the application tried to do them, it wouldn't work. You'd get an error. So this one in particular is saying that this allows me to modify or delete the contents of your SD drive. So this writes a file. This creates a file. Um, modify system setting to prevent tablet from, from sleeping. So like if you're playing music, you can prevent the tablet from going into sleep mode. It will. Actually allows you to record audio on this. You could, you know, I could do some yodeling or something and record it and upload it to SoundCloud. Uh, your precise location, the ability to add accounts, personal information, read your contacts, full network access, read phone status and identity. So, you know, it's kind of kind of interesting and kind of scary in a way when you see that this application can read my contacts, however they're defined. So, but that's a nice like level of assurance if you were doing something that you didn't want the ability to read your contacts or whatever, then you, you know, you're at least warned about it. And it has to be in a manifest, otherwise it's going to air out when you get it. All right. The more we get into a tighter integration between our applications and the rest of the Android world, the more these permissions are going to come into play. All right. I guess here's where I was getting confused. I was thinking that there was uh, six activities, one for each class and one for each layout. But as we look at the manifest, there in fact is only four separate activities. Well, wait a minute. Pardon me? I'm looking and there was one that looked like it was Here's an activity here, 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 and actually here. Oh no, that's that's associated with this activity. All right. Each of these has the layout and the strings file, and there's an XML for the main view. Let's look at the main sort of activity. How did I know that this is a main activity, that this is a guy that gets the ball rolling? Well, you could probably guess. All right, based on the names of them. But the better answer is, if I look at the Android manifest, you'll see that the activity that's the main one is the slideshow activity. So we know it's this guy. Whole bunch of imports. Uh, on here. This application does file input output. So I didn't think we were going to cover that in this class, but this is good to cover um, because this is one of the ways that you can get persistent storage. Remember we said there's a shared preferences where you can store some very limited kinds of information. There's databases where you can store more involved information, you know, with a true app. There would be sort of a cloud kind of storage where you really wouldn't store anything on the device, but you might connect to a server on the other end uh, through the network and store stuff out there. For example, something like Google Docs or something like that. The other option that we talked about is file storage, and this one does that. All right. This application starts like most of them do. All right. And first thing it does 
is it runs out and it finds essentially a list of the slideshows. The slideshow data is stored in a file called enhanced slideshow data.ser. Let's actually run it, create a slideshow, and go and look for that file. Notice that it, if there is no slideshow, it pops up with a little alert saying touch the menu button to create a new slideshow. listing shows this. And if I go out of the application altogether and go back in, it still shows me my alert and it shows me a list of the applications. There's a little tool that I can go and look and look to see on my SD card where the files are. For example, here are the pictures. There's a camera folder. And I'm thinking if we look in the right place, we will be able to find particular file that is being stored. 